What is the costliest decision that people make in their lives? Or someone might be starting a business, and some of you can attest to that. Or someone might be purchasing a house. Or some getting married. I'm not sure how he can take that, but it might be the most costly decision a person might make. Or most of you remember Princess Diana. When Princess Diana was married to Prince Charles in 1981, the cost of the royal wedding amounted to nearly $48 million. For some once-in-a-lifetime vacation might be the costliest decision a person might make. When we hear the word cost, we usually think in terms of money, we think in terms of price tags and dollar sums. When we consider making a financial decision, our first instinct is to look for what? How much is it going to cost us? If it's within our ability to purchase, if we think the total cost is going to be worth the long-term benefit, then what do we do? Well, we swipe the card, we write the check, we open the wallet, hand over the cash, we sign the purchase agreement. But what is our instinct when it comes to the cost of following Jesus? Many so-called Christians today have embraced a kind of Christianity that is essentially cost-free. Many have accepted a kind of gospel that promises you all the benefits and none of the expense. But as we look in God's word this morning, Jesus himself tells us that in order for a person to become his disciple, he must embrace the reality that following Jesus comes at a very high price tag. If you are going to follow Jesus, it will come at great cost. In our text this morning in Luke chapter 14, Jesus identifies three areas in our lives in which following him will cost us. So please turn with me to Luke 14 if you haven't already, and we'll see the first area where following Jesus will cost us in verses 25 and 26. It says here, beginning in verse 25, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, before we do anything else, we need to make sure we're rightly understanding what Jesus is saying. Because there's a word that's probably lunging off the page at you here in verse 26. What's that word? Hate. Okay, you all saw the same word I did. Wait a second, <laughs> is your initial response, right? Is Jesus saying that we need to hate people? I mean, the word hate comes uh, with pretty unpleasant thinking in our minds, doesn't it? Like, uh, like being bitter towards someone or bearing a grudge against someone for something they did to you. And maybe you vowing to never speak to that person again. Maybe wishing that someone had never been born. In other words, when we, when we hear the word hate, we're envisioning a kind of hostility that a person might have toward another person. So is that what Jesus is talking about here in verse 26? That wouldn't make sense, would it? Especially if you were to look back at Luke chapter 6, there's another group of people that Jesus is saying to love that we wouldn't expect him to say to love. He says, love your enemies. So let's keep this straight. You hate your family, but love your enemies. That doesn't make sense. And I think if you look at other scriptures, you'll see confirm the fact that Jesus isn't actually saying to be hostile to people when he says this. For example, Ephesians 5.25 tells husbands to do what? 
Love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Well, that doesn't sound like hatred. Ephesians 6 verse 2 tells children to honor their father and mother. That doesn't sound like hatred. So what does Jesus mean when he says that we can't be his disciples unless we hate these relationships? Let's look at a few passages that I think will help us get a better sense at what Jesus is, is communicating here. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 29. Genesis 29. I'm going to... The main verses I want to focus on is verses 28 through 31, but just give you a little background here. This is a story of when Jacob, the son of Isaac, went to work for his uncle Laban. He, 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 uh, he wanted to marry Rachel, and, uh, and Laban pulled a fast one on him on the wedding nights. Jacob married a woman he thought to be Rachel. Her face was covered with a veil. Woke up in the morning, and behold, it was her sister, Leah. Well, that didn't rub Jacob the right way. And so Laban says to him, well, you know, you, you, you have to marry the older one first before you can marry the younger. And so uh, he tells Jacob there in verse 27, you know, fulfill her week, right? finish her marriage week. And we'll give you Rachel as well if you serve with me another seven years. And so you come to verse 28, that's what Jacob did. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And so he, Laban, gave Jacob his daughter Rachel as wife also. Laban gave his maid Billa to his daughter Rachel as a maid. And then notice verse 30 here. It says, Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more. And Leah, he served with Laban still another seven years. And then verse 31 says, when the Lord saw that Leah was, and, and here's the literal reading, right? King James has this. You'll see it probably in a note at the bottom of your Bible. That's, if you have a different version. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated. That's the Hebrew word that's used here. So you compare that with verse 30. It says that he loved Rachel more than Leah. Now I don't know if we can take away from this that he was actually hostile toward Leah. He just didn't love her the same way that he loved Rachel. He loved Rachel more than Leah. And that's communicated in this Hebrew word, hatred. Right. Another verse I want you to look at here is Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. The Apostle Paul actually quotes Malachi in a statement that he says here. But I want to look at here in verse, uh, verses 10 through 13 of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, go ahead and follow along as I read verse 10, it says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children, and notice verse 11 here, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, right? They hadn't had any chance to display any kind of one person being more righteous than the other. That the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have what? I have hated. Now is God being purposely hostile toward Esau here? Or is he choosing one person over the other? In his purposes for Israel, he chose Jacob over Esau. 
It's not that he's singling out Esau as an object of hatred. So that's what we ought to see this verse communicating. It's not that God was being hostile toward Esau. In fact, God blessed Esau in some ways. There's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament concerning Esau's descendants, Edom. But this was his choice of Jacob over Esau. He preferred, he chose Jacob instead of Esau. And then, of course, you have Matthew 10, which we read together earlier this morning. Matthew chapter 10. And this is where Jesus says in verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So when we see this language that Jesus uses, very vivid, very stark language of hatred, what he's communicating is the amount of love that we are to have toward Christ in comparison with other people. He's communicating in a very stark and sobering way that your love for him must take priority over your love for anyone else. Your loyalty and devotion to Jesus must transcend your loyalty and devotion to even the closest human relationship that you have in your life. So here's a way we can explain what Jesus is saying. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must love Christ more. And here in Luke 14, 26, we begin to understand the first area of our life that following Jesus will cost us. You must love Christ more than any other relationship. If you do not love Christ more than any other relationship, you cannot be his disciple. Let me give you an illustration that hopefully will help us understand what Jesus is saying here. Let's say um, many of you, you are ladies here. Okay, you're a lady here. Let's say you're married and neither you nor your husband have ever heard the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you hear the name Jesus, you associate it with what you say when you smash your thumb with a hammer. But then one day you see that new neighbors are moving into the vacant house next to you and it's another married couple about your age. Over the next few weeks, you and the neighbor's wife start hanging out, and you discover that you have a lot of interests in common. But you also discover that she's a Christian. And she starts talking to you about Jesus, like he's actually a real person that she knows really well. And she asks you if you'd like to read some of the Bible with her, and you say, well, I'll, I'll try anything once, so why not? And you start reading this thing called the Gospel of John, and you start getting to know about this man, Jesus. And you begin to realize that this is no ordinary man. This Jesus is God in human flesh. And you begin to realize that you're not as good of a person as you thought you were. In fact, Jesus came to earth to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And because of what Jesus did, your life and your love rightly belong to him. You finish reading the Gospel of John and you come to realize that you need to repent. You need to turn from your sinful way and you need to submit your whole life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So with your friends sitting there beside you, you pray to God and you tell him that you believe what his word says about you what his word says about Jesus, and you ask God to save you from your sin and make you a follower of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit of God enters into your life. And God makes you a new person. And God gives you a hatred of sin that you never had before. And he gives you a new desire to obey everything that he wants you to do. And God gives you a love for Jesus that is greater than your love for anyone else. 
And about that time, your husband comes home. And you tell him, honey, I'm going to start going to church. After he gets back up by, off the floor after the shock, he says, what's got into you? <laughs> well, I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior and I want to obey him. At that moment, life between you and your husband might become a bit more challenging. Because your life for Jesus has taken priority over your love for your husband. Maybe you and your husband had been in the habit of going up north every weekend. But you love Jesus more. And you know that you need to be regularly gathering with other people who love Jesus. So you tell your husband, we're going to have to make changes to our weekend habits so I can go to church. Maybe you and your husband had been in the habit of watching movies together, and you suddenly begin to notice how wicked and profane those movies are. And as a follower of Jesus, your love for Jesus now takes priority over spending time with your husband putting that kind of evil in front of your eyes. You say, honey, I just can't watch these kinds of movies anymore with you. There is so much in there that Jesus would not want me to fill my mind with. So you tell me, after a few months of being second place to Jesus, do you think that your husband might start interpreting your love for Jesus and the changes in your life as a kind of hatred toward him? You think that might be what he starts thinking? She must hate me. We used to be closer. We used to have more fun together. I feel like I'm in competition with this Jesus, and I'm losing. That might be what the disciple of Jesus has to prepare himself or herself for. Becoming a disciple of Jesus may lead to tensions in your marriage. In fact, your unbelieving spouse might be so fed up with being second place that he's saying, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I'm done. I, I'm leaving this because I, I can't be second place to someone. Are you prepared for that? Maybe you grew up in a close-knit family that practices another religion like Judaism or Islam or another sect of Christianity like Roman Catholicism or Mormonism. If you become a disciple of Jesus, your brothers and your sisters and your parents may actually view your love for Jesus as a form of betrayal to them. They may even threaten to cut you off from the family if you do not renounce this Jesus and return to the family's religion. That's the cost. Of following Jesus. Those who follow Jesus have come to grips with the hefty price tag that they might have to pay. It is not a decision that can be taken lightly. You must count the cost. Have you truly come to see that following Jesus is worth a family member turning away from you because you love Jesus more than them. Because that might be what happens. But that's not where the cost ends. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, they cannot be my disciples. Not only must Jesus take priority over every other relationship in your life, Jesus must also take priority over your own life. When you become a follower of Jesus, you enter a life where his priorities must now become your priorities. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and keep living for yourself the way you always used to. From now on, every choice you make must be brought to the feet of Jesus, and you must ask, is this what my Lord would want me to do? Occasionally, Megan and I have 
talked about where we might move if we outgrow our house in Riverview. Some of you have been to our house. It's a relatively small house. It's got three bedrooms, about 1,000 square feet. If our family grows much more, we might have to consider up- upsizing. So, should we move somewhere that has a lot more space? Should we move out into the country? You know, that seems to be the kind of location a lot of families with growing children like to move. But what question must guide any choice that Megan and I might make? Is this what Jesus would want me to do? It doesn't matter if I like the idea of getting a place with several acres. It doesn't matter if I want to live somewhere that's much more peaceful and quiet. Is it the place that Jesus would want me to live? Would I be in a better position to carry out his priorities? Would I be able to better accomplish his goals for my life that he has revealed to me in his word? That's what motivates my choice. That's what makes my decision for me. Because as a follower of Jesus, I now must submit my priorities to his. My love for Jesus must be greater than my love for myself. I must deny myself if I want to follow him. So we see, first of all, that we must love Christ more than any other relationship. When love for Christ and love for family come to conflict, love for Christ wins. When love for Christ and love for yourself comes into conflict, love for Christ wins. That's what following Jesus will cost you. If you do not love Christ most, you cannot be his disciple. But the second area of your life where following Jesus will cost you, we see, is in verse 27. It goes on to say, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We could say it this way. You must love Christ more than life itself. In his book, Tortured for Christ, Romanian pastor Richard Wurmbrand describes the cruelties that he and other Christians experienced during his 14 years in communist prisons from 1948 to 1965. Here's some of the things that he says in his book. What the communists have done to Christians surpass any possibility of human understanding. I have seen communists whose faces, while torturing Christians, shone with rapturous joy. They cried out while torturing Christians, We are the devil! Christians were hung upside down on ropes and beaten so severely that their bodies swung back and forth under the blows. Christians were also placed in icebox refrigerator cells, which were so cold that frost and ice covered the inside. I was thrown into one while I had very little clothing on. Prison doctors would watch through an opening until they saw signs of freezing to death. Then they would give a signal and the guards would rush in and take us out and make us warm. When we were finally warmed, we would immediately be put back into the icebox to freeze. Thawing out, then freezing within minutes of death, then being thawed out again, over and over again. It goes on to say, Westerners have probably heard about the brainwashing in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. I have passed through brainwashing myself. It is the most horrible torture. We had to sit for 17 hours a day for weeks, months, and years hearing, Communism is good. Communism is good. Communism is good. Christianity is stupid. Christianity is stupid. Christianity is stupid. Give up. Give up. Give up. Several Christians have asked me how we could resist brainwashing. There's only one method of resistance to brainwashing. It is heart washing. 
if the heart is cleansed by the love of Jesus Christ, if the heart loves him, one can resist all tortures. What would a loving bride not do for a loving bridegroom? What would a loving mother not do for her child? If you love Christ as Mary did, who had Christ as a baby in her arms, if you love Jesus as a bride loves her husband, then you can resist such tortures. My friends, when Jesus calls a man to bear his cross and come after him, as one writer has explained it, Jesus bids him come and die. You realize that those disciples and apostles who were closest to Jesus knew full well what Jesus was talking about here. Some of you are familiar with the Fox's Book of Martyrs. 16th century writer John Fox tells us in his book how those well-known early followers of Jesus embraced Jesus' call and came after him carrying their own crosses. You've read about Stephen in the book of Acts. Stephen was stoned to death proclaiming Christ. James, the son of Zebedee, brother of John, was beheaded by Herod. Philip was beaten and crucified. Matthew was killed with a halberd. Mark was dragged through the streets and burned. James was beaten, stoned, and his brains were dashed out with a club. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Andrew was crucified for two days and still preached to the people. Peter was crucified upside down. The Apostle Paul was beheaded. Judas, who was also known as Thaddeus, was crucified. Bartholomew was beaten, crucified, and beheaded. Thomas was thrust through with a spear. Luke was hung. Simon the Zealot was crucified. The Apostle John, he didn't die, but he was boiled in oil. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You must love Christ more than life itself. That's the price tag of following Jesus. In God's providence, you may not be called to physically lay down your life for the sake of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus have been called very seldomly to actual martyrdom in the United States for which you and I are probably very thankful. For the 250 years of our nation's existence, we have had what we call religious freedom without fearing the persecution that many of our brothers and sisters around the world face daily. But that is the depth of the love and the loyalty that Christ demands of those who are his disciples. Because if you do not love Christ more than life itself, you cannot be his disciple. Following Jesus comes with a cost. You must count the cost if you are going to follow Jesus. Jesus goes on in verse 28 to give two illustrations to stress just how necessary it is to count the cost of following him. It says here, verse 28, which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. There's a restaurant up where I live in Riverview that has never opened its doors. It was expected to open back in 2017, but for various reasons, I don't know, the opening was delayed. My family moved in there in 2019. It still hadn't opened. In the spring of 2020, apparently it had begun staff training, but then, of course, COVID happened, and nobody was open. And in the summer of last year, a for sale sign appeared on the building. I don't know all the details. And COVID certainly didn't help. But it appears that the owner of that restaurant failed to count the cost. 
And you go on the Riverview Facebook page today and you'll see all kinds of jokes being made about this restaurant. You don't start a building without first counting the cost. You don't start a business without first counting the cost. Jesus gives another example here in verse 31, this time using an illustration from war. He says, well, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Now, I'm not a betting man. But if I were, I'd bet on the army with 20,000. Wouldn't you? Is it worth the risk to fight when you're outnumbered two to one? Is the high risk of defeat a cost that you are prepared to pay? Or would it be less costly to raise the white flag of surrender and submit to terms of the stronger king? And Jesus is making it abundantly clear who is the stronger king in the situation? You or Jesus? Jesus is the stronger king. He is offering us the conditions of peace with God. And the conditions that he offers, the cost of peace between us and God, we see in verse 33, he says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. You must love Christ more than any other relationship. You must love Christ more than life itself. Verse 33 reveals what we might call the third area where following Christ will cost us. You must love Christ more than absolutely everything. Not just more than people. Not just more than life itself. But you must love Christ more than possessions, more than wealth, more than hobbies, more than financial security, more than a political party, more than a country, more than comfort in your retirement, more than having things easy in life. You must love him more than doing what is most convenient. You must love him more than finding a cure to your medical problems. You must love him more than climbing the corporate ladder. You must love Christ more than absolutely everything. If anything in your life takes priority over the priorities of Jesus, if your love for anything in your life is greater than your love for Jesus, if you do not consider as abandoned, as lost, everything belonging to or having to do with you, Jesus says, cannot be my disciple. Jesus must be Lord over everything. You must love Jesus more than everything. This is what defines the disciple of Jesus Christ. This is what being a follower of Jesus looks like. This is the cost that Jesus requires of us. So have you counted the cost? Perhaps you're sitting here right now. Are you counting the cost even now? It's crucial that we understand what it means to follow Jesus. You cannot separate the identity of the disciple of Jesus from the cost that Jesus calls him to lay down. Do you see it? Do you get it? Do you understand this cost? Do you realize that you cannot consider yourself a follower of Jesus if you've not embraced the cost? 
we know that we might not consider the cost consistently. We know that there are going to be days when we fall. But hopefully, as followers of Jesus Christ, we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, we have indeed counted the cost. We know what Jesus calls us to do. We've embraced that. We've said, Lord, I know I'm not going to do so perfectly, but I'm going to lay down my life for you every day. I'm going to love you most every day as you help me. And when I don't, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross and paying for that sin. But Father, I count the cost. And Jesus Christ is worth it. Verse 34, as Jesus concludes, Jesus says that the disciple of his can be compared with salt. How do you compare a person with salt? Well, this is how he does it. He says, salt is good, but the salt has lost its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor for the dunghill, or the manure pile. But men throw it out. What is the value of salt? The value of salt lies in its saltiness, doesn't it? What if salt has no saltiness? Does it have any value? Does it have any value? Salt without saltiness has no value. You're not going to put it on your french fries because it's not going to enhance the taste. You're not going to use it in preservatives because it's not going to preserve. It has no value if it's lost its savor. What is Jesus getting at here? A disciple, someone who claims to be a disciple, that doesn't follow Jesus is just as worthless to him as salt that has lost its saltiness. A disciple that doesn't love Jesus more than anything else or anyone else is just as worthless as saltless salt. And he's going to be thrown out. He's going to be cast out. As Jesus says of the church in Laodicea, it's going to spew you out of your mouth. And Jesus ends with a very sobering conclusion. Because he recognizes that this is a very heavy conversation. This is life and death. This is something that has eternal significance. And so he says to all who are willing to listen, right? He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so all those people who are listening to him unload this heavy reality. The reality is, many would say, well, I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to listen to that. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. But there may be some here who will. If you have ears to hear, if you have the kind of ears that seriously is listening to the words of Jesus, then that's who Jesus is talking to. That's who Jesus is seeking to engage People who see Jesus Christ and see the cost of following him and say, all right, I'm in. I buy that. So my friends, are we listening to the words of Jesus this morning? Not just hearing a bunch of words being read from some book, but actually listening to the Son of God with ears 
that will take these words seriously. Jesus calls everyone who considers following him to count the cost. Because being a follower of Jesus will cost you. Your love for people in your life will, by necessity, have to take second place to your love for Jesus. Your love for yourself will, of necessity, have to take second place to your love for Jesus. Your love for life itself must take second place to your love for Jesus. Your love for everything in your life must take second place to your love for Jesus. But here's what we must not forget. Here is what we must not lose sight of. It's following Jesus and loving him more than everything worth the cost. Is it worth the cost? You better believe it is. Because if you embrace the cost of following Jesus in this life, Jesus will deliver you from sin. Jesus will deliver you from death. And he will raise you to a place in his kingdom where you will forever live with the one who loved you and gave his life for you. My friend, I don't know about you, but for me, an eternity with Jesus is worth any cost that he might require of me in this life. So my friends, let us pray that he will continue giving us the faith and the love to follow him whatever the cost may be. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you. We have seen your word. And Father, I pray that all who sit here are hearing your word with ears intent on receiving. And Father, I praise you that for the most part, the people in this room have said, Jesus is worth it. And yet you remind us today of something that we need to regularly be reminded of. When even the Father of Jesus needs a reminder of what it means to follow him. When we follow Jesus, we must come to remember that we are strangers in this world, that this is not our home, this is not our final destiny. There is something more in store for us, and everything that we do in this life and every relationship that we have in this life and everything that we have and possess and, and, and prize in this life must be submitted to the priority of loving Jesus more. And Father, I pray that you would help us to daily embrace the message that Jesus Christ has given us today. And we give you glory for what you will do in our hearts as we listen with ears that hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.